प्रोफेसर अमीना का किशोर प्रोफेसर इकबाल अहमद प्रोफेसर मराठे प्रोफेसर पाटिल प्रोफेसर किदवाई एंड फ्रेंड्स एज वॉज मैंशन जस्ट नाउ दैट आई एम नॉट ए स्पेशलिस्ट इन द फील्ड ऑफ इंग्लिश लिटरेचर my exposures have been to more often than not to russian literature but then there are there are there are no boundaries between the literatures because literatures in literature be that native or non native be that english or english literature or literatures in english there are there are always running threads which are symptomatic or symbolic of human concerns human predicaments human pathos human anything or everything human i am grateful to professor amina kishore in fact uh, seems to me i am i am a poor sub substitute for uh, for dr uh dr abid hussain that i was forgetting the name of my chancellor of my university in fact he was to be invited and he probably couldn't come and then suggested to the organizers that in instead i should be invited and he phoned me up also not to say no uh let me i can't do justice to the to to the assignment that has been given to me as mr abid hussain would have done but let me try to make some rambling remarks uh i agree with the organizers and the earlier speakers that bold attempts are being made in coining new terms for meeting new realities in the realm of literatures non native is 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 one such term i'll not dwell on it because scholars have already done it a new perspectives i would say a few words about it seems to me nothing is new in the world if you go by the theory of postmodernism nothing has any beginning or any or theory of intercontextual contextuality intercontextuality uh no work is an original work a work has no beginning no ending is a tax walking into one tax walking into another gliding into another tax sliding into another tax so this gliding and sliding goes on as there is no beginnings so there is never ever any newness moreover as they say history repeats itself but the question is whether history repeats cyclically or spirally cyclically if it repeats then it would come back to the the, the point from where it started and it will go it will go on doing the cycles and there won't be any any anything new in fact it will be repeated newness but but if it is a, a development or repetitions in terms of spirals there could be some newness that too cycle is there but spiral is either one step lower or one step upper so there could be some newness so it's is a moot point as to whether perspectives could be ever ever new uh i wanted to come to a point important point about the nativeness particularly in the context of english language and english literature mainly in the context of english language that english as a language today is nobody's patented property 
Uh, it was mentioned by Professor Marate that even in England, there are several Englishes. Around the world, there are a huge number of Englishes. And let's not be apologetic or let's not have an inferiority com complex about Indian English. Indian English has come to stay and it has already made its place of niche. And let's carry it forward whatever it is. Let's not try to be like the Britons, like the British, or like the Americans, or like the Australians, or like the New Zealanders. Let's try to be uh, in our own uh, territory. And let's try to be strong enough, both in terms of teachers and researchers. In fact, Indian English has come to stay in more than one census. There is, if you talk in terms of, as, 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 is, the, as is fashionable these days to say, the world has become a globalized village. People can easily cross the borders and close the gaps. And English is one weapon with, with which this uh, can be done very easily. It is in this context that the English Indian has got stabilized, has, got, has become a very important phenomenon thanks to our young men and women crossing the borders and closing the gaps thanks to, because, because of the, uh, thanks to the fact that they, they are equipped with English language. In that sense, English is a universal language now. And it is used in different countries in the interest of those respective countries. And it can be very well used. So India should rise to the occasion and harness its potentials. We have tremendous potentials in the field of English studies. Uh, in the beginning, uh, when we were just chatting over a cup of tea, it was mentioned that India has great advantages in terms of English language. Even if you compare with country like, countries like China, China is, space, uh, is supposed to be overtaking India in all other spheres, but not in the field of English. Because we in India now study English not only speak in English, not only in the classroom, but outside the classrooms, which is what doesn't happen in China. So China cannot beat us. Uh, on these parameters. Uh, since we are a reasonable country in terms of uh, uh, costs, there, and since there is a huge demand for English language these days, a big number of students would like to come to India to study English, provided we could provide uh, them the facilities at a reasonable level. People would not go, like to go to Australia and pay $30,000 a year. They would rather come to India where they can manage in $2,000. But we have to provide them. We have to create a home away from home for them and take good care of them and convert them into friends of India when they go. So uh, Professor Kidwai was saying that his students, as soon as they do the degree in ELT, or ELE, they immediately go to Middle East and they are left, left with no candidates to come for the interviews, to knock at their doors for the, for the job, etc. That's a very interesting point. That means English studies in India has a, has a lot of potentials and there is no unemployment in the field of English studies unless you are choosy that you want to work only at a particular university if you want to work only at Hyderabad University or at our university or, or stay only in the city of Hyderabad, then probably there could be some problems. Uh, so for India, English is no more a liability. I remember, you know, I would like to mention that when uh, Pandit Nehru and his colleagues had conceived uh, the Institute of Central Institute of English, in as far back 
as in 1958, that should speak volumes about their vision, about their foresight. Those were the days when we were hostile to English because only a decade had passed since we attained the independence. And uh, uh, nas nationalism had not waned as yet. And in those days, Nehruji thought of setting up an institute of, Central Institute of English for training the teachers of English in Hyderabad, the first incarnation of my uh, present university, which later on became CIFL in 72, and then 92 became a DMD university, and now it is a central university. Nehruji, while speaking at this institute, CIE, in 1963, had dwelt at length that English, though there is a problem with the English walas, those who know English, those who speak English, they consider themselves as a class apart. And Nehruji had mentioned that there is a tendency in India, class getting converted into caste. Casteism is, a, you know, is the biggest bane for India. So that had to be avoided. But he, more importantly, he dwelt on the fact that if there is, there was an interaction between English and Indian languages and English literature and in, Indian literatures, both stood to gain something from each other. He had, his, his ten page, I mean that speech is the, that run into ten pages and very important points were made that both English would learn, would gain something by interacted, interacting with Indian languages and vice versa. Uh, which is coming true, by the way, these days. We have learned a lot through it, thanks to our, our exposure to English sources or sources available in English language. Uh, speaking about English literature, or rather, uh, no, rather in Indian English literature, I would also, I would also feel tempted to make uh, a few uh, random observations. I may not, I hope I'm not wrong if I say that the tradition of Indian English literature was uh, kind of founded by uh, writers like Mulkraj Anand or R.K. Narayan, Narayanan. Uh, Mulkraj Anand's Kuli and other works, uh, untouchable. I had read them at, at, at a younger stage in my life. I was deeply touched by such works. Here were the works which had Indian concerns uh, being voiced very powerfully. Here were the works which were grounded in Indian, Indian reality, reality of Indian villages, reality of Indian uh, urban life. But subsequently, it seems to me that the Indian English literature deviated more often than not towards, uh, as it has been said, towards diasporic concerns. Diasporic, the term diaspora itself has got metamorphosed into something else than it was initially, as was mentioned by uh, Professor Kidway. We tended to look towards Western writers, particularly of Indian origin, and more often than not try to uh, follow in their footprints. As a result, whatever I have read, I don't, don't find powerful portrayal of, say, of an Indian rural woman a peasant woman in English in his write, writings. Mark Indias did something, but in one or two novels, more often than there, there is rural life is generally absent or it is there episodically. And that, is, that certainly would suggest that there is a big gap in Indian English writer. Diasporic concerns cannot be the concerns of uh, a larger readership, Indian readership. Yes, they may be very important for the diaspora. They have their own problems, Indian diaspora. In America and England, there will be 
a huge range of problems. They are neither here nor there, torn between several cultures. Uh, dichotomy between the, 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 between the generations, dichotomy between the, um, what we call in Hindi sanskars, our sanskars, original sanskar and new ethos that they had to imbibe or had to, which are imposed willy nilly on them. All kinds of concerns are there, but they are not by and large Indian concerns. So, creating or basing your literary work, creative works, shall I say, on alien concerns, it could not be very meaningful, could not be very productive, could not be very, you know, very powerful in terms of literary messages or literary, uh, or whatever the literature wants to pursue in achieving those goals. Uh, there is, I mean, even diaspora is not uh, uh, homogeneous. It's not monolithic. You have non-resident Indians who half the time of the year spend here and half they spend there. Their lot is still worse. They don't know where they belong to and whatever they write, you know, it was mentioned that Anita Desai is in the morning in Delhi and in the evening she's in London. And that's why we have the works like uh, Inheritance of Loss, etc. Uh, I don't know what you think about it, but uh, I have my own concerns about that, about her concerns. Uh, yeah, I'll just. Now, uh, I would have spoken a few words about the correlation between the ancient and Indian poetics and Western literary theories. This is a very big area. In fact, if you could correlate our studies, particularly theoretical studies, uh, uh, to ancient Indian poetics and ancient Indian literary theories, which, has, which remains unexplored by and large, in, in, even uh, in a country where it was born. Um, misconceptions about people, Professor Kidwai has mentioned, I wanted to cite the example of Russian literature and Russian people being treated almost in the same shabby manner as Islam or Islamic uh, uh, culture has been done. But in Russian culture, I would have mentioned Pushkin, where uh, Muslim culture found a very powerful reflection. He has a big poem called Bakshi Sarai, Fontaine, where you were mentioning the depiction of harem, similar depiction is there, a very powerful depiction. I wish I had time and could have spoken about it. Uh, lastly, politicalization of literature. A very important point uh, which Professor Kidwai has touched upon. It seems to me that there have been attempts in the Western world to convert in literature into anti-literature. And probably it was realized that if you take example of Russia, Russian literature was one particular phenomenon which, which had maximum impact on Russian society. It molded the destiny of Russian society. It became a a uh, harbinger for Russian society, not in only, uh, in fact, that was the only credible uh, phenomenon which Russian, Russians trusted. Press was under censorship, no freedom was there before the revolution, I'm saying. In fact, it is widely believed in the West that Russian literature led to Russian literature, uh, Russian revolution. In fact, Tolst uh, Lenin had said that Tolstoy was the mirror of Russian literature because Russian literature was always addressing the concerns of its people. Of course, not in a generalistic manner, in a very artistic manner. You all know Russian literature has been very powerful, particularly, particularly 19th century Russian literature. But that literature led to, re uh, led to a revolution, which uh, is not to the liking of powers that be in the West. 
So literature should be detached or disassociated from the social concern. The political, there should not be any politics in literature. Politics means in everything there is a politics, as you know, in life. So no social concern should be voiced through literature. It has to be an abstract literature. Uh, it has to be a very recondite kind of literature, not uh, accessible or understandable to everybody. It has to be a literature only for elite. And maybe I'm wrong, but this this is how I feel, that most of the Booker Prize winners, literary works, Booker Prize, Booker Prize winning literary works, uh, I'm not sure about Rusmal, even I was not very much enamored by even Midnight Children by Rushdi. But somehow they don't, didn't touch the chords of my heart. They didn't. They, maybe, maybe I was naive, maybe I'm a very poor uh, connoisseur of uh, literature. But others were worse. Now, inheritance of loss, winning a Booker Prize. What, is, what I want to say is that sometimes Western uh, sources, Western forces project such, literary, such works which may not be per se literary works grounded in Indian soil. They don't want any social concerns to be reflected in literature. As a result, such literary works do not, I mean, main, according to me, in my understanding, a literary work should touch the chords of your heart, should, uh, should uh, lead to some kind of catharsis, should make you sit up, should make you think over, should make you cry with itself, with the characters, to make you live with the characters, to... Uh, that's how... The, uh, that's, how uh, that's how I know what was in Russian literary works. But such literary works are dubbed more often than as works of vulgar social, sociology or socialization. I don't want to be intimidated by these kinds of allegations because I myself dabble in some kind of writing and frankly speaking I felt it when my first novel appeared it was in English called A Fall, a Fall of a Hero. It was reviewed quite uh, widely but I didn't see the warmth in the, uh, in the response of the uh, readership. When I published this, the, uh, the, not translation, but version in Hindi, plot was the same, but is de deviated from the English version quite considerably, the response was altogether different. Because the English leadership it seems to me more often than more often than not is elitist in its, uh, shall I say, uh, aesthetics, perceptions. Whereas Hindi readership was much more simpler, and my my works reflected the the, the concerns of Indian rural life or Indian society, and that was the difference. So this this uh, dichotomy between the Indian English studies and Indian English literature and the Indian society needs to be addressed. Thank you.